This first one is for um, Grenfell survivors. It's called The Missing. I don't think I need this mic. I'll be all right. As if their bodies became lighter. Ten of those seated in the front pews of the church began to float and then to lie as if on a bed. Then down the aisle as if on a conveyor belt of pure air past the congregants, some of them dropping to their knees in prayer, muttering, what about me, Lord? Why not me? The missing, moving slowly, so slow as a funeral cortege, down the aisle of the church, out the gothic doors, and up into the sky, finches darting deftly between them. Ten streets away, a man tries to hold on to the feet of his floating wife, and at times her force lifts him slightly off the ground. His grip slips and falls with just her high heels, shoes in his hands. As she is backlit by the sun, he shields and squints his eyes. From a tower block, a hundred people start floating out the window. From far enough away, they could be black smoke from spreading flame, a man with his child on his shoulders, men in sand-colored galabiers, indigo hijab flapping in the breeze, an artist in a wax cloth head wrap, all floating slowly, so slowly. Someone looking on may think them new arrivals to earth, like human lantern wishes. They became the city of the missing, and we became the city of the state. Should I read next? <laughs> um, oh, I know I'll read. I was in, um, I, because this is about home, so. I was in Yorkshire at a literary festival. And, um, we, we, you was there, Nick? Yeah, no? No, you were, yeah, you was there, yeah, yeah. <laughs> With Nick McCoy. And in this literary festival, they had, like, beef patties. <laughs> So I was like, whoa. So I tried to buy about 10 just to support, you know. And um, went back to the hotel. And then uh, a friend and colleague, Zena Edwards, she, her, she, her mother had to prove that she was English. And she was in bits. And, um, and I, was, I, was, I was like upset too. And I, I made this massive call. I was like, we need to write a hundred Windrush poems. Everybody, every poet I know, everybody I taught, write a poem. And I put it out online. Some magazine picked it up and put the call out. And guess how many poems I got? I got none. That's what I got. I got zero poems. But I wrote my own. And I'm going to read it to you now. Uh, Citizen One for Zena Edwards and her mother. So, okay, so this is part poem, part rant, and it kind of moves quite quick, yeah? <laughs> for Zena Edwards and her mother. So, after slavery, colonialism, two world wars, teddy boys, skinheads, rivers of blood, speech, neo-Nazis, Thatcher, three kids, five grandkids, a cozy council house, 20 floors up, and a small pension, now you want to send me home. <laughs> oh, wow. Even the sandwich van outside the station is selling jerk chicken sandwiches. Wow! Yet you claim to not know how she got here. I can buy beef patties at a literary festival in Yorkshire. <laughs> Truth is, you were always planning my departure. From the moment I walked down the gangplank, freestyling London is the place for me. I noticed you wasn't clapping. <laughs> or smiling. I can't help thinking that this has always been the plan. In the long game, we've drawn the short jab. We can hear it in the whispers. Even as you squared your bed sheets and deliver your blue veiny kids on the ward. As soon as the labors were done, we could hear as we turned our backs, Darky, Sambo, you must think we're dumb. Are we dumb? From the slave ship to World Wars to the underground and the hospitals, it's always been about the labor, never about the living. 
cheap muscles and blood to build you an empire. It has never been about our living, never about our tambourine church, our Christmas rum cake, the audio science of sound systems. Our relationship has never been more than strained at best, though you may have been to carnival. <laughs> Once. <laughs> Every second street name is a shout out to my slave captors. This one is going out to the Wilberforces who whipped a little less than the Beckfords. These are the streets we walk through. We need some black plaques on these buildings, goddammit. Here lived Florence Carver between 1960 and 2005. And boy, she took no shit. My gran said, let Enoch Powell come to Brixton, talking that river of blood shit to her face, and he be spitting a river of salty blood in his mouth. To this day, her grandchildren still bring rage to the page. So the unspoken question remains, what to do with these darkies now we wrung them out? Aha! Warm up the plane, boys. We are returning a cargo called Generations. What do you mean my dad can't return from holiday? The burden of proof is on us. Again? Think legality, think lineage, at very least get the grandkids into a jail or two, or better yet kill them in the street, on CCTV, on cell phones, it doesn't matter, it's fine, they think. These people are an easy target. They do not organize, centralize, or come as one. They've got no major media outlets or effective representation in government. We can send them back for months without this thing even breaking. I smell subterfuge and sleight of hand. These people keep meticulous records of everything, even their genocidal imperatives. Hell, I could go online right now and check the condition and price of slaves you brought and sold in your family. Yet our records, poof. Disappeared. Congratulations. You fooled us. How can you be banished from your own home? Render your work, not your lives. Cheap muscles and blood to build you an empire that we can't stay in. Grand's gone missing from Saturday morning market. No one is frowning at the quality of the yams or how the snapper's eye is so cloudy. There'll be no Saturday soup tonight. <clears throat> one twenty two. Okay, a short one. <laughs> I um I was talking about how my son's birth story was very convoluted and um I got helped through it by uh there's a nurse uh who helped me called Grace and she's a very senior nurse. And this is a love letter to the NHS and also all the West Indian nurses and nurses in general who keep the lifeblood of people, keep people alive through pure instinct. That was a year we danced to the green bleeps on screens. My son had come early. Just the one kilogram of him, all bald head, bulging eyes, and blue veins. On the ward, I meet Grace, a Jamaican senior nurse who sings pop songs like they are hymns. <laughs> she says, your son too feisty. He just pulling off all the breeding masks then. People talk of her in hushed tones down these carbolic halls. And even doctors give way to her when it comes to putting a line into my son's nylon thread of a vein. She warns junior doctors with trembling hands, may only letting you try twice. <laughs> On her night shift, she will pull my son's incubator into her room, no matter the tangled wires and confusion of machine. On morning rounds, when the consultant tells my wife and I that my child may not live and he may never leave the hospital. She pulls us quickly aside and says, him have no right to tell you that just raw so. Another consultant tells her nurses to stop feeding a baby who may soon die. And she tells her loyal nurses to feed him. No baby must dead with a hungry belly. And she take that well-fed baby close to her bosom in the dark and rock back and forth, humming the melody to Happy by Pharrell. <laughs>
And I think to myself, if by some chance I am not there, and my son's life should flicker, then Greece, she should be the one. Thank you.